Hi, welcome to Kick-Ass Switch, putting the K in magic. I'm Joanna DeVoe, and you're watching another episode of Every Which Way. This time featuring Jackie DeVoe! Yay! I know so many of you are cheering out there because we all love Jackie, the official witch of Orange County. And this woman probably needs no introduction because if you watch my channel, you're probably watching hers too. But if I am lucky enough to be the one to introduce you to Jackie Dubois, let me just say that you are in for a treat. I double dog dare you to try to find a person who is more unique, more delightful, more totally themselves than Jackie Dubois. And I'm betting that you can't do it. And just to prove my point, here she is, the official witch of Orange County. Yay! This is so pretty, this Ooh, fringy thanks. thing. Look at that. Woo! I know it looked like one of those 1950s housewives in their, in their curtain kind of bathrobes. <laughs> anyway, when we were kids, um, my Nana and Fa had a pool, and it was like the big thing back in the hippie days to make like these these robes for being around the pool out of towels. And so that's what it reminds me of. Oh, I totally know what you're talking about. I it's know, a little I more glamorous than that, actually. <laughs> velvet. They didn't have burned velvet back then. <laughs> well, I'm going to keep that in. I'm just going to start the interview now because... Oh, okay. You're adorable, and that's cute, and I think people would like to admire your outfit for a minute. <laughs> uh, uh, and you're adorable, too. All of us are adorable. Woohoo! Yeah. Adoration. <laughs> so, Adoration. Uh, let, me, let me officially welcome you to Every Which Way, Jackie Dubois, the official housewife of Orange County, or the official, sorry, witch of Orange County. <laughs> I am a housewife too. A kick ass housewife. Yeah, I'm a I'm well, yeah. Yeah. I'd just be a kick ass if I had to. I've been to your house. It's quite magical. <laughs> like every single corner. The spiders that live there probably have like their own little table with doilies on it and <laughs> like Actually they do their own gig. We call it we don't call it spider webs, we call it spider lace. Nice. Yeah. Cause I don't, I don't knock them down hardly as much as I need to because I'm not a very good housekeeper. So I just have turned it spider lace and it gets to stay up in the corner. <laughs> nice. Well, I wasn't commenting on your housekeeping. I was just saying every square inch is like decorated. It's just like eye candy. I would have loved if I could kick you guys out so I could just explore on my own. <laughs> Dig through all the cupboards and stuff. Well, I think that happens, you know, because astrology is so fascinating. I could make myself wrong and bad about that. And I'll tell you why I could do that. Because I am married to a Virgo mm -hmm. who, who is very, you know, he's very clean. He's very orderly. And after all these many decades, I think 37 years now we've been together, he doesn't really own much of anything. And... If I wasn't in the picture, he would live like in an I Ikea kind of environment, like blonde furniture with white curtains and the essentials. But I have both my sun and my moon in the second house. And for you Tauruses out there, you know what I mean, because Taurus, that house is ruled by Venus, and Venus is luxurious beauty, sensuality, loves fine things so that's one of the ways that we can read our natal chart to find out who it is that we are and then you know where I, whereas I might be tempted to say god I got so much crap around here I can say it's natural I come by it natural it's supposed to be like that yes I'm a Libra lots of Venus in my chart I totally relate to that and lovers vary your husband who you call lover he is so patient he just loves you my husband. So you're right. I wanted to ask you about that too, but he's so patient with you. He just lets you do your thing and he's not only patient, he like enjoys it. He just completely appreciates like every bit of your jackiness. Can you explain for my viewers why you don't use the word husband? I love yeah. I love your explanation of this. Cuz I'm a weird word witch. 
And I believe that words are spells. And I can also see that within our languaging, there are, on purpose, there have been implants and overlays which come in and negate our magic through our words, mm -hmm. which is our logos, which is our ruach. It is spirit. And so I often, with my apprentices, I ask permission to go in and retool their languaging mm -hmm. because etymologically speaking, the word husband and the word wife mean the owner of, the husband, like the husbandman of the vineyard, and the wife is the employee of, like I sell fish in the market, I'm a fishwife. So we don't use that languaging when when we're speaking magically. But if I'm if I'm talking to AT and T about my <laughs> lover's name is on the bill, I speak to the muggles in their language that they can understand and I will say my husband Dan. Yes. But he is not the owner of myself and I am not his employee. We are actually um, we have actually mastered in this lifetime a matrimonial auric field, which is an initiation where two literally become one. And what this is, is it's the last card in the tarot. It's the world card, and that is androgyny. So it is the meeting of the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine in the lover's embrace, making the six-pointed star, so that when invisibles look at us, they don't see separate beings. With Lover and I, because we've, we're in this matrimonial auric field, they don't see me unless they see him. They don't see him unless they see me, which is a fraction of the truth that all are one, all are friend, and there is enough. Beautiful. And for those who don't know, you're a tarot reader. I'm a reader of everything. Yes. When, you, when you're a diviner, you, you are able, through, through the gateway of the tarot, which actually really means the womb of the great goddess, you are able to read what source is speaking to you everywhere. If it's animal medicine, if it's in your own body, because the, uh, the, all the planets are in our body, we can read what's going on in our own body, astrologically. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, we can read palms. Your life is on your palm. A diviner reads everything, everywhere, at all time. I don't sit in front of a 7-Eleven waiting for Lover getting his lottery ticket. <laughs> I'll the address on the building and quickly doing the numerology on it. I am constantly looking for God through divination, which is the practice of seeking the divine. You must have been a fascinating Christian. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I know. You're, well, I know that you could take your love of Jesus. You've taken that through every stage of your life and that you used to be very involved in the Christian church. I just oh, feel yeah. like, yeah, I think you must have been quite interesting uh, back when you were in the Christian church, I'm sure you gave everybody like a lot of food for thought because <laughs> you right. tend to take everything a little bit deeper than the rest of us. Well, within the Christian church, a woman doesn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so within the Christian church, a woman is relegated to teaching children and to teaching other women and especially older women teaching the younger women. And... I, I'm okay with all of that because everybody holds a piece of the truth. And um, there's so much mystery within all of that. And I honor my path through every single place that I've been. I, I understand it to be a tapestry that I'm weaving in this particular in this particular incarnation of which I am called Jacqueline Dubois. But that's just my, my uh, ego um, image that's put out, you know. So... All of us have these paths that we take, and so every single thing, nothing happens skewed or out of balance or off kilter. It all means something. 
And so when I moved through the Christian church, I was actually guided there because, not because I had been raised with Christianity, I wasn't raised with any religion at all. My, um, my family didn't go to church, and we did say a grace over meal, but that was the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And my extended family were, were religious. And none of my neighbors, because back then everybody lived in the same neighborhood the time they were growing up, none of my neighbors were religious. So I didn't really know anything about religion. But on one fateful night, which happened to be Halloween, All Hallows Eve, Sao Huen's Eve, actually to us, on the Witch's Wheel of the Year, <clears throat> I was out trick-or-treating. I was 14 years old. And um, I actually had an encounter with Jesus the Christ. And my entire life shifted. Within the context of not knowing anybody else that was Christian, for some reason I kind of knew who Jesus was, but I didn't know anything really about him. I, you know, we didn't even have pictures. You know, a lot of people have pictures of Jesus in their house have anything like that nor any of my friends so there I was as a freshman in high school at that time and it just so happened that a movement of the Holy Spirit which is the death card in the tarot Shiva um, in Hindu uh, thinking there, there was in my area something called the Jesus people and it was a true movement of the Holy Spirit. And whenever the Holy Spirit is moving, it's all about love. And so that's when Brother Jesus showed himself to me. Now, I wanted more. And so being the curious sort that I am, at 14 years of age, I, by, by that I mean, I wasn't going on buses. I was hitchhiking. I hitchhiked to places where these Jesus people would be. And... Know what this was all about. The movement was very, very spirit-led, which I believe is what's happening in the pagan movement right now because they are so open-hearted. Mm -hmm. And the movement within the Christian church, per se, was very open and pliable and loving. And so I joined the church, both, and then um, I met Lover when I was 15. And so... Lover and I then spent the early years of our life together raising our children within the church, but the spirit wasn't in it. You see, the spirit moves, and you got to go sniffing for it, and that stay ply. That means you have to go where the spirit moves, even if it isn't, you know, co corresponding to your rules and regulations mm -hmm. or what she says right. So we did our best to stay in the church while following spirit. And so most of our earlier years when we were raising children was we were guided to have homeless people living in our house full time. So while we were raising and homeschooling our kids, our home was a shepherding home where mothers, homeless mothers and children lived as well. And so we were quite different from your normal Christians. They were busy. And then Spirit guided us <clears throat> when I was in my late 30s. By that, you know, having grandchildren, my grandchildren were coming into my life. And um, we were guided to make a sojourn into the Catholic Church. And it was, it was so wrenching. But when you're following Spirit, and those of you out there who are doing so, you know... Sometimes it's not copacetic with what's inside. I was just sickened going into the Catholic Church as a fundamentalist Christian going into the Catholic Church. First and foremost, because the church that we were at, or we were guided to here in San Clemente, was called Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Church, and they had have a huge two-story mosaic of our Blessed Virgin Mary draped in blue with two pillars on either side. Oh, the high priestess. <laughs> because um, 
priestess is Isis, who is Mary, who is Sophia. She has not left us alone, and she will go into churches to find us. So don't think that you are wasting your time if you're being guided here, because that is exactly where I met the goddess. I did not know the goddess before that. And we, we stayed another seven years there, learned everything that we could about ritual, and magic, because the Catholic Church is about ritual and magic. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Tarot cards show all of the tools that are within there, and these are keys and codes, clues. And just like going into the labyrinth where we're following the clue, which is that, uh, you know, when you're looking for the minotaur in the labyrinth, the clue means that little string that was left as, as the guidance to go deep into heart center in the labyrinth. And you really, you don't just, your spirituality is not something you put on for church or when you're practicing witchcraft. It's just infused in everything you do. Your life is quite magical. And since I am all about kind of presenting different ways that people have created the kick-ass life of their dreams, I'm wondering, I suspect with you, this is just the way you've been your whole life, but I'm going to ask anyways, like, when did you start consciously creating, like, your own little world, you know, this world of magic that you live in that extends everything from your garden to your home to your relationship with Lover? When did that start for you? It was Lover. Uh, Bye. Um, my earliest memory is my mother pu pushing me out the back door because you know she was a young mother and she had three kids bing bang boom and she said go out to the place so she pushed me outside the back door with my little brother paul who's a living saint by the way i actually have a living breathing saint as a brother and she was inside with my other brother john who is a fundamentalist pastor and um I digging in the ground. There were lots of potato bugs and bugs and that was my whole life. I was digging a hole to China. That was my earliest memory. <laughs> Why was I digging a hole to China? I knew that my twin lived on the other side of the world, which is which is truth. We all have gangers on this planet. We have the exact opposite of what it is that we are because we're polarity and so that's the earliest touch with that. And then I actually met my doppelganger through a shamanic plant medicine journey that I did with um, my special plant teacher, um, Huachuma, which is called San Pedro. One of my journeys where I actually met my twin, which is really your twin flame. Lover is not my twin flame. Your there is not your twin flame. You have a dog on this planet who is carrying out with you, your highest purpose for being here. And I was thrilled and honored to actually meet my doppelganger. And that's the earliest memory, was digging a hole to China so I could meet my doppelganger. That is such a cool story. This is why we love you, Jackie. You are so full of surprises. I never know what's going to come out of your mouth. Like, screw my notes. I mean, I, like, wanted to ask you questions, but but now I just, like, need to, throw, you know, follow the thread of where Jackie's going and hang on because you never know. <laughs> I do want to ask you about your farm. Well, it's not a farm. Your Herbin homestead. I love that you call it Herbin, as in, like, herbal. Can you tell us just a little bit about... I'd like to know where that started for you, and then now it's grown into making your own kombucha and having the cutest baby goats on the planet. They're so adorable. Like, can you take us a little bit through that, how that growth happened? Sure. Well, when I was homeschooling my kids... Um, we, I homeschooled for 18 years. Wow. Plus, Lover and I were not satisfied with the schooling that would be provided, uh, and we truly wanted to introduce our children to what was important to us, how we felt spirit-led. 
So we didn't want to send them to Christian schools, even though we were Christians, and most certainly not to the public schools, because we wanted to teach our children how to, how to live their highest dreams and greatest joys. So we've always had chickens, backyard chickens, and all kinds of other animals. And we've lived in places where we could have that. And then we also always had gardens, but not like we have <laughs> Yeah, you've got a great garden. Um, now I'm really excited to see that um, the whole sustainability movement is guiding people to be responsible for their own lives and providing for themselves and seeing that you can actually do it. Mm -hmm. So even though we've always had, um, you know, the chickens and we've always done as much as we could, this is like really super getting on the court. Because our goal is to provide ourselves two years of stored food that we uh, that we preserve ourselves from food that we have grown biodynamically, organically, in communion with the nature spirits. So it's actually a communing with the nature spirits around us. Our little little brothers and sisters where we are we have past had that communion with the little people and we're going to have that communion again as we move farther into this uh, new golden age so we have a very large garden which we've had a lot of challenges with because we live in a neighborhood where everything was scraped off and the soil has to be rebuilt again mm -hmm. So we're doing that with our freegan greens, because we're also freegans. We're doing that with our animal manure. And we're rich rabbits, because currently we, we do eat meat, and we are uh, aware of the factory farming and all of the pollutants, the hormones and the pesticides, and, and the horrible conditions that animals live in. And so we have an agreement with the animals that are here, that we will serve them humbly and then they will serve us and we are completely and 100 percent knowing that we are not serving them as much as they are serving us because they are giving their life for us we are giving our life for them so we are are looking at this in a native american or original people's type of a way but mm -hmm. changing because we have some uh health issues here which may have us back on a vegetarian path again, but that's sort of up in the air. And then we also have our chickens. We have chickens who are in milk right now. And from the milk, we don't just drink raw milk, but we make kefir mm -hmm. from it. And that's our probiotic. And then we can also make goat cheese from that. We can't make butter, but that's okay. We just use our, our olive oil, which we are buying. So our goal is to buy as little as possible in our commitment as freegans anyway. And then we have birds too. We love bird songs. We love the canaries and the finches and the parakeets and the roller pigeons and the cockatiels. Birds are very healing for the human body. We urban homesteading because I'm a green witch and so I've been into herbs for a long, long time since I was 15 years old just after I had this kundalini awakening when Jesus appeared to me. But, call it urban homesteading, U-R-B-A-N, because that has now been copyrighted and you're not allowed to use it. So, that's all right. You can do something else. Instead of, you know, bashing the guy that, that copyrighted it, you just get creative. It fits you. It's perfect. And you must be so busy. I mean, you have a lot to do every single day to keep all of this up and running. I wouldn't, I mean, would you say this is something someone with a job full time outside the house could do? Like, I'm imagining they would have to scale it down quite a bit. Like, this is what you do is taking care of your animals and your garden and your home and running your business from home. Sorry. I'm just going to say it like this, and this is not even a judgment, and, and so I have a full-time job aside from all of that, and that is um, filming, editing, yes. producing, which is of Orange County, which takes a long time, mm -hmm. daily 
radio broadcast on Blog Talk Radio called Two Witches at the Monastery. I have a witch blog that I write daily on our website, themoonmother.net. I'm also committed to stay in contact with all of our friends on Facebook through photography. You know, so I take pictures and put those up on Facebook um, in a desire and an intent to inspire and encourage others to get on the court for their highest dreams and greatest joys. I'm also a pagan iconographer. So painting, you know, painting the icons that I paint, it takes me full, a full day to paint one icon. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that and more. Plus, my father is very ill, so I caretake my father, and I have mentoring. Uh, you know, I do mentoring, and I teach classes over Skype and here in person. So I do all of this as an old lady... <laughs> you are not an old lady. <laughs> yeah, the Mayans say that you get to call yourself old, which means revered, at age fifty-two, and I'm going to be fifty oh. in uh, in a in less, maybe a little more than a month. So I get to call myself an old lady, and what that means is that I'm a revered crone. You see, so I don't really listen to what the matrix, the brainwashing, the implants, and the overlays of the matrix have to say about getting older. I always wanted to be older and always relished the time when I could get to this place. So I stand proud to say I am an old lady with wrinkles and gray hairs. And you know, it's ironic because you're one of the most youthful, childlike, and I mean that as a compliment, people that I know. So maybe that's the secret. You are embracing being a crone. Um, you don't have the fear of it, so it's that childlike innocence that you bring to everything just shines through despite whatever, a gray hair or a wrinkle. <laughs> yeah, it's actually kind of nice getting older, you know, because uh, you, you would know this. If you're blessed with uh, a beauty, an uncommon beauty or a beauty that... Um, that the matrix holds valuable because that's what their level, their bar of value is, is somebody with a beautiful body and a beautiful face. And when I was younger, that's, I, I did possess that. And it does give, and I don't anymore. And don't say that you do because I know from whence I have fallen, the dew of youth has fallen <laughs> about that because now I can go around in this old lady costume and not have to deal with um, the Matrix's idea of what is valuable. It's coming from my heart center. And that, what I just said right there, is completely authentic. And you won't hear a lot of people in the Matrix speak about this. Because what that does is, oh, what a prideful thing to say. Right? But I know that I don't speak from pride. I know that I speak from humility. And so I address these issues. So a lot of times people are, they have a lack of self-worth because maybe they don't hold the bar of the approved beauty of the matrix. This is exactly why I named our YouTube show The Real Witches of Orange County because I'm two cities away from the original real housewives <laughs> and I was appalled at what was being presented there and appalled at the popularity of that and how people aspire for that and so this is precisely what I'm talking to now is that there's so many women out there and men as well who are subjecting themselves to anorexia bulimia, um, surgeries that will implant silicone into their body in all different parts in order to be at that bar. And that is an implant, an open of the matrix. And it's not what living in the spirit is. So since I'm an old lady crone, I can say stuff like that that other people can't get away with. The freedom! <laughs> 
Yes. You know, I always said I was going to call myself a witch when I was an old lady because I feel like you can just get away with almost anything. Um, but I started doing it a lot earlier in my mid-30s, uh, so I guess I just got there faster than I had anticipated. And you definitely played a part in that for sure. I think, you know, you often say... I am the self-appointed official witch of Orange County, and you can call yourself whatever you want, and uh, there's power in that. Absolutely. This is uh, one of the tools of the witch is making a declaration. Mm -hmm. Part of the prayer that I use whenever I'm casting circle, and I cast circle even when I'm teaching tarot because... Tarot is sacred scripture, and it is to be honored in that fashion. So the prayer that I use is I make a pentagram on my body, and I say this, In the name of the Father and the Mother, our Holy Spirit of Consciousness, our Holy Angel, and myself, be it unto me according to my word, you see, what that does is that's a declaration that I am in line, click, click, with these other beings I just named. Naming is powerful. And is putting myself square on the court and announcing to all visibles, whatever I say goes. What that means is I better watch what I say. I better really tool my languaging. If I'm making powerful uh, declarations and I'm going to be putting negators in there or self curses upon myself, then I've got to stand up there and take it and live it out. Mm -hmm. The reason why it's important to find these things in our languaging. Kind of the explanation behind this I am message that's been going around a lot in the last few years, um, the power in saying I am XYZ, whatever you follow that up with, or just a simple I am. Right. Well, the I am actually is in the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Hmm. And um, the I am, which originates from Moses standing in front of the burning bush, which is also on the lover's card, in the tarot, the Rider Waite tarot, that I am is I am the becoming one. That's what that means. So when, when we say that about ourselves, it is our declaration that we are the becoming ones when we get into heart center and we are the ones calling the shots and we are actually utilizing free will to do that. We are growing God. I am the becoming one. The one. We are all one and we are all God. What a lot of people don't understand about free will is that 99%, I don't know how much, just a major amount of people don't even exercise their free will in, in an entire lifetime. Because if you're living in the lower three chakras in your ego pain body mm -hmm. and not making the initiations of the tarot, which are swords, wands, cups, and pentacles. These are not just elements. These are actual initiations. If you are not making those initiations, you are not living in higher, higher self, in your heart center. You haven't used your spinal column, which is your 33 degrees, which is your Jacob's Ladder, also known as Osiris' Ladder, to get here in your heart center and actually begin to use your free will. Most of us are, are spending a lot of time in our lower three chakras designed by the matrix to keep us there. And we are simply zombies or automatrons who, upon getting certain kinds of news or being around certain kinds of people, having our emotions expressed, will act in a way that is completely, uh, you know, I know if I do this, they'll do this, like a machine. Mm -hmm. Once we make those initiations and we live in our heart center, through the initiations of the watchtowers, 
which we call when we create our magic circles. So many people are calling these watchtowers and they don't even know them. When we make these initiations, we then become the mass of the watchtowers. And they are eager to serve us. But if we haven't made these initiations, we are coming from a low place and calling them, not knowing that we're coming from the lower place. And they will work against us because we live in polarity. You see, who we are is like Merlin and Arthur in the Grail mystery stories. Arthur was king from the moment he was conceived. But he was given to Merlin as a snotty-nosed brat. And Merlin's job was to let him know that he had authority, that he had power, and that he was the ruler. Now, the throne had been overgrown with weeds in the, in the Grail Mysteries. But little did everybody know that even within their midst, this king, this authority, because that's what kings are in the tarot, was being raised up to know exactly who he was, know thyself, by Merlin, who, who is the four elements, teaching him, and then offering him back to the throne again and bowing his head, but up to the point where he was offered up to the throne, I'll bet you, bet you a million bucks, Arthur had a few swats on his rear end saying, uh-uh, that's not how it goes. And the watchtowers will do that to us. So this, when we get into witchcraft, it's it's nice. It's sort of, um, it's like a honeymoon when you begin. But if you go further, if you go five layers deep, it's a rigorous initiation. It's a rigorous programming of path in the Kabbalistic tree of life. And just like Jesus said, who was a Kabbalist and an Essene, he said, there's a narrow pathway, which is the pillar of mildness. Small, actually, in the translation, it is a narrow footpath, and few there be that find it. This is what I mean by going five layers deep. So we can't get away from this. Why? Because we are God. We are drops of the divine, growing God through growing our souls on this planet. And that's magic. That's the magician card in the tarot. And you continue to go deeper and deeper in your own practice. I mean, you just made a video talking about accountability. And, I mean, I just thought that was a wonderful example of someone who we all hold in a certain amount of esteem. And we learn a lot from saying, oh, here I am. Like, I'm learning another Thing about myself. I'm learning another lesson of accountability, and I'm going to take you with me on this journey. Uh, it's great, and I know a lot of people have hopped on that journey with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey of the Shrinking Witch that you just started recently? Well, you can go to our YouTube channel, The Real Witches of Orange County, and follow along with us if you'd like. We don't know what's going to happen. We have, in authenticity, and in childlike uh, faith in the divine, entered into um, a part of our journey where we're going to allow ourselves to heal some traumatic, heart, heart-rending things that have presented themselves in our life. And we've talked a lot about that in the past, so you can see that on our channel. But part of this has resulted in my gaining 40 pounds. And a lot of times when people are looking to lose weight, which is part of that whole matrix thing, they're just thinking, you know, first layer deep, I'll, I'll lose weight. But there's a lot to this. I consciously knew that I was putting on all of this weight and also putting more pain in my body um, by internalizing the tra trauma that my life presented to me, mm -hmm. which was divinely presented as a gift. It took me five years really to really shift this around, or this ship around, I call it, to say, you know, I not just forgive, but 
I and, and allow the pain to be silent, I actually now joyfully thank everyone concerned as my greatest teacher in my humility for inflicting all of this pain upon me. And now I'm ready to let go of the weight. And so I'm doing this consciously, like bringing everything forward. And there's a certain amount of shame that I was dealing with when I first started this because, like I said, I've never really been overweight like this before. And oftentimes when people see me and they haven't seen me for a long time, they're just like, oh. you know how you are when you see somebody who's getting a lot of weight and you're not going to say anything, and wow, you look a lot older than you, you know, that kind of thing. So I had shame associated with that. So a matter of fact, my own grandchildren, I got to see my, my granddaughter the other day haphazardly at a Costco. I say haphazardly, but it's not true. <laughs> Our Lady gave me a dream two days before saying that I would, and then I saw her there. But she didn't recognize me because of the self-inflicted pain and the gaining of the weight, and plus my hair was blonde and I had really long hair extensions at the time. And Anyway, we started this to share that it's possible to heal. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to because I didn't want my hopes to be dashed on the rocks. Then I got to bring that five layers deep. And then yesterday, oh, I'm using green juices and our eyeballs are floating, but I feel great. It's been almost a week. My pain level of a 10 in arthritis in my hands has now been down to about a 4. And that is incredible to me because I couldn't even open jars anymore. And I was sort of starting to say this is what my life is until one day I sort of woke up. But then yesterday we had another wake-up call because Lover was in the emergency room last night with atrial fibrillation. He has heart disease. And he has had a heart attack and a quadruple bypass 14 and 16 years ago respectively. But frankly, through all of this trauma and this free fall in our lives, we lost everything. Our house went into foreclosure, our business was shut down, we, we live extremely frugally now. And we didn't have any health insurance, and so he hasn't been able to see a doctor. But it occurred back in November where we thought he had a stroke, and we were able to get on MSI. So yesterday we went to see the doctor. She took uh, one of those heart things, and she said, you get your butt over to the emergency room right this second. And so today I made a video on the Shrinking Witch series, which expands this paradigm out even further, because this isn't about losing weight and getting a tennis outfit on again. This is love. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people out there who are very sick, and it's not just arthritis and hobbling around, but maybe it's cancer, or maybe it's multiple sclerosis, or heart disease. And, you know, lover could check out early. If we don't get on the court with our accountability about this. And so what the doctor said is, no more alcohol, no more cigars. You really have to walk daily to save your life. You must get on a healthy diet and lower your cholesterol and your triglycerides. And he's pre-diabetic. That was one of the reasons why. No more alcohol. So, you know, Lo Lover and I have enjoyed tipping a pint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is something that was really important to me when I started Kick-Ass Switch is that I addressed food. Like, that was, like, the first program I created because there's magic in it that does go five layers deep. It's Maybe it's the surface. Maybe you want to change the way you look. But it changes your health. It changes your spirituality or at least helps you go deeper with it, and it really helps you to release things. That's why I liked that you were talking about um, the trauma and relating that to weight gain because we, we pat ourselves to make ourselves comfortable um, or we create pain for ourselves. And I'm not saying that food is the answer to everything because 
I did watch your video. It was great. I watched it right before we got on Skype together. But um, we are all going to die. That is a part of life. But it is, to some degree, our responsibility to take care of ourselves. And food is a great way to do that. Yeah, it's one of the keys and one of the codes. And this is this is actually addressing since we're talking we were talking about the four initiations of the tarot. This is the initiation of wands in the south, Saint Michael the Archangel. This is called the desire body. And the desire body, the initiation of the desire body is taking a real look at your habits and what you prefer. And then take these things and saying, now, is this my ego's desire? My ego slash pain body's desire? Or is this my higher self's desire? And then saying, you know what, I this was me, myself, and I's desire, but this act is being sourced from something else. So the tarot teaches us through the initiation of wands to shift our desire body and the offering that we make to the divine. Because when we cast circle at Espets and Sabbaths, you know, we're supposed to go in there with gifts to our Lord and Lady. We don't go in there just like babies to get, 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 get. And here's my intentions, get, get, you know, it's... We go with a gift and we give something of ourselves. This is called sacrifice, which a lot of people don't like that word, but that's exactly what when we're burning incense in there, that's a, an oblation or a sacrifice, the burning of that. But it is a physical manifestation of something that's happening in the spirit. And so we bring a gift. And the gift of the, the initiation of the desire body is to offer ourselves. In other words, to say, our Lord, Our Lady, I offer to you my preferences, my human right to have preferences in this incarnation. I no longer desire to have my preferences. I desire that my preferences become your preferences. Now that's heavy duty. But that's where witchcraft leads you to. People think they're leaving the church and they're leaving all that behind, but when you get back years deep, it's all the same thing. It's all about getting into alignment with the divine who you are. Yeah, I think that's the key to um, the law of attraction, too. When you first get into it, it's about like, ooh, I want a new car, or I want to manifest $100. And at first, when you're new, that stuff works, but then it stops working for you, which is kind of a call to go deeper and to align with your soul and your spirit and that source energy and to come from that place. And then once you're coming from that place, everything becomes magical. And a world that is beyond your wild, wildest dreams starts opening up for you because you can't imagine something that big when you're coming from a place of ego. You only can imagine that $100 or that car. You can't really get into that place of living a life from heart center and being in love with life and being in love and just enjoying just that sensation of being in love with like a beautiful flower or the rain or just a gorgeous day. That starts becoming what you get in alignment with and sometimes that can be enough. For a little while, you see the lower three chakras, which is... I like to say that's the home of the ego and the pain body functions on strict polarity. So what that means is if you're asking for $100 and then you're getting it, because it's polarity, there's going to come a time when you're going to be a minus $100 just because there's polarity there. So whatever you put into the field on that side will show up exactly the same way on the other side. Do you see what I'm saying? You can't get. I see what you're saying. I don't agree, but I see what you're saying. Okay. Well, let me go further. When you, because you you may see more of what I'm talking about when I go further and I say when you climb the ladder, or you do the path working, and you access heart center, which is fifth density, mm -hmm. it's the Kabbalistic tree of life, and it's about emanations and concretion. So let's just say that the, the lower three chakras are the home of Malkuth, the, the descent into matter, 
where things are low and slow, mm -hmm. you know, extreme polarity. But move farther up the tree of life into the fifth density heart center of Tipareth, this is where there is still polarity, but it is lessened. It gets finer and faster. When you get up into sixth density at the Anja Chakra, there is no more polarity when you're functioning in these higher levels of ascension. So does that make more sense about what it's talking about there? It, uh, yes, I just have a different understanding of it. I consider the top three to be the masculine and the lower three to be the feminine. And when they meet in the middle, that is masculine and feminine coming together to form source energy, divine love, that creative, beautiful place of manifestation that lives in your heart, the I am. I agree. You see, that's the wonderful thing about um, when you go five layers deep, you are able to hold different like you're able to spin more plates at a time, so it's it becomes <laughs> both and. It doesn't have to be an either or. The first one, the Kabbalistic tree of life, it's an either or. The higher up in the Kabbalistic tree of life is a both and, and then at Kether, it's like the big mush pot of love. It all just like sort of swirls together. You know, it's a big goo. I love that you're a plate spinner, and I love that you can bring it all together and have it make sense for the rest of us. I think that's awesome, and I, I do want to wrap this up because I try to keep my interviews short. Maybe I can like get you back on here and we can talk more in the future, but before I let you go, I just want to know one tip that you have for a muggle, for someone who is not practicing witchcraft, or for someone who's very new to the path. Um, or maybe just practicing a new age spirituality or a very tuned in Christianity, what could they do to start to create the kick-ass life of their dreams that's individual and personal just to themselves? It's all about love. That's it. It all boils down to love. Hold a space of love as long as you can. And if you can hold it for one second, perfect. If you can hold it for two seconds, per it will then exp exponentiate to four seconds. That's all there is. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. It's all about love. We are all one. We are all friend. And there is more than enough. I love it. I love you, Jackie. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I, I thank you so much. I am grateful, so grateful to see your happy, smiling face again. <laughs> Love and bless, bless. Peace.